Well, we did it. We invited Jacqueline Millay of J.P. Mint Consulting back on the show. This is her fourth interview with us. And that's if you don't count the two where she went through the consulting process on a resume and cover letter with Hannah. So really, this was her sixth time being on the Educators Going Global podcast. So we really owe Jacqueline a debt of gratitude. As always, we had many helpful takeaways. Our main interest was in finding out how things were going with her consulting business and with recruiting for the coming year. Jacqueline didn't disappoint, providing detailed information that anyone in the recruiting arena would do well to take on board. She shared lessons learned in her business, takeaways from the past year, trends she sees for this coming year, and lots of words of wisdom. And she also gave us a little insight into how much she's enjoying being part of the International Teacher Podcast. This introduction is kind of short because you, our listeners, are familiar with Jacqueline and hopefully already follow her website and her posts on social media. This episode was recorded on November 21st, 2023. So put your recruiting hat on and without further delay, let's dive in with a big supporter and collaborator of EGG, JP Mint. Hola, Jacqueline. Welcome back to the podcast as a fourth time guest. Woo-hoo! Am I the first? Am I the first yes. fourth time? Ooh, yes, you are. What an honor. Mm-hmm. Well, it's it's awesome to have you on because you're so helpful. And we're going to dive in to the questions in just a second. But we need to ask, or I need to ask, ¿En qué parte del mundo estás? Ah, muchas gracias, señor David. Estoy en Querétaro, México. I'm in central Mexico, where it is a chilly 16 degrees Celsius outside. It just dropped from 27 earlier today, so I don't know what's happening, but I'm wearing two sweaters because I am no longer Canadian blooded. Oh, my. Well, hace frío uh, allí. So I just want to let our guests know that Audrey is not the only egg host who speaks other <laughs> languages, by the way. Very nice. <laughs> yes, and I'm not feeling too terribly bad for you, Jacqueline, as I sit here in the negatives Ooh. in Vermont. So you know. yes, you're quite bundled <laughs> up there as well. Oh. Yeah. It's hilarious. Every time that we pop open the video conference room, she's more bundled than the last time. <laughs> mm-hmm. All right. The onset of winter for sure. All right. Well, Jack, let's get rolling here. I follow you on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, and I really enjoy how you post images of yourself in a country where you've recently helped a client land a job. So continuing on this theme, do you have a going global story for us? Oh, yes. So yes, those are my throwback Thursday posts. And I kind of, I really do enjoy going through my old photos, trying to find the right photo. But yes, whenever I have a client who has a successful interview offer and signed contract, they let me know. And then I put it on a throwback Thursday just to let my peeps out there know that I am happily getting clients hired. And so one of my going global stories is I think it was my first year teaching in Oman. I was there for a total of seven years, but we had an annual week called Discover Oman. It was the week without walls. And so we did our little trip to a nearby village, did some camping, desert camping and things. But my story pins on the experience that we had with some of those local guides that were working with us. And they were digging this big hole. And I said, what's happening? What are we doing? And we're all watching this, the teenagers with me. And they said, oh, we're getting ready to make our traditional dish, shua. And this is, I think it might be goat meat. I'm not entirely sure, but it's some kind of a meat with a lot of spices. And when I say spices, I don't mean hot to the taste, but just Everything in the kitchen sink, cardamom and coriander and all kinds of spices, cumin. And so I'm watching them 
first make the spices and they're wrapping the meat with all the spices. And then they start wrapping it with banana leaves and they build a fire in the bottom of this pit and they put the banana leaves with the meat inside on top and they rebury it. And they said, we're going to come back tomorrow and we're going to enjoy Shua. And so I turned to our guide and I said, so are you going to post a security guard here? And he kind of stopped and he looked at me. He said, what? I said, well, because, you know, somebody might steal our meat. <laughs> and he looked at me and he started laughing. Tears were coming down his face. He turned to all his other guides who just helped make all this shua and explained in Arabic what I had just said. And they all laughed. And he turned and he said, the whole village knows this is your meat. No one's going to take this meat. But that's where I came from. You know, I was like, we have to protect the meat because someone's going to steal it overnight. But no, the whole village knew that this was our meat and we were going to enjoy it the next day. So that's my going global story. Only the whole world thought that way. Mm -hmm. Very, very polite. So that is a great going global story that leads into our guiding question, because now you're an international teacher consultant and you help people recruit to places like Oman. And uh, so what we're wondering is, what are some lessons you've learned in your role this past year? And how does recruiting look now? So let's start with shifting. You know, you recently switched from being an educator to a recruitment consultant. What are some of your lessons learned so far in this shift? Well, I don't know if it just comes with age, but we're all of a certain age. I'm looking at the three of us where we are the ones with experience. <laughs> we're the ones with the expertise. And I don't know when that happened because I still kind of feel like I'm finding my way along in my 20s and 30s. But oh, no, all of a sudden we're the ones with the answers and we have teachers in their 20s and 30s and 40s out there looking for us for guidance. And so I guess that for me has been my biggest aha moment. Whenever I meet a new client and I'm chatting with them and talking about my experiences, I can just see in their eyes, they're like, whoa, I can't believe I have somebody that has all this experience talking to me. And then I think, um, geez, yeah, that's right. Uh, almost 25 years overseas. It just happens in a blink of an eye. Yeah, absolutely. So you're loving it, though, sounds like. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. My favorite part of the day, if I have a client video call, everything goes on hold. My friends here in Mexico, they know when I'm out of touch, it's likely that I am putting all my focus on a video call client where I get to either introduce the new world of international teaching to them or a veteran international teacher who's still looking for some extra help, some extra guidance. And a lot of times I'm the cheerleader. I'm just the one that says, you can do this, keep at it. I just keep encouraging them. And I have many hats. That's pretty cool that you kind of wake up and you go, wow, I've got a lot of experience. I've grown my skill set. I can do this and that great reward of helping others. So what are other lessons that you've learned in this past year, just about the consulting business and yourself? Well, I suppose, as Audrey said, you know, that I really love this. I think this is who I was born to be rather than maybe even a French teacher, although I am still teaching online and I usually just volunteer my services at this point because I do love it, but I really love helping people and I really love helping teachers find their way through the international world. So the very first thing I do, I know people say, don't look at your phone the first thing you do when you wake up, but that's the first thing I do because I'm excited to see if I have any new clients most of the world is awake while I'm sleeping here in Mexico. I have a lot of clients in Africa and Europe and Asia and Australia. And so all those parts of the world are awake while I'm sleeping. So I wake up and I get to see if I have a new client. And oftentimes these days I have. I wake up, I see a new client, I see who they are, where are they dialing in from, and when am I meeting them? And then I get very excited to 
look at their CV, look at their experience. It just happened to me before our phone call today where I have my first PhD client. I was like, oh my gosh, it's a doctor. (laughs) So, you know, immediately wanting to see how I'm going to be able to help these people. Are they already overseas? Are they veteran teachers? They know the ropes? Or is this someone completely green to international, but yet a teacher, as we say, back home? I'm curious if you have a sense how many of your clients are new to international education versus veterans. I would have to say 80% are already overseas. So I have a very small niche of about 20% maybe where they're completely new to international. And I'm always curious to ask, you know, where did you hear of me? And uh, more often than not, these days, it's been the International Teacher Podcast. So thanks to Greg, Kent, and Matt for inviting me on to be a co-host. They're hearing me out there and a lot of teachers in Australia and the U.S. are listening to the ITP and reaching out to me then and saying, okay, I'm ready to take the jump. That's awesome. Yes. That really is great news on a couple counts, and we're going to talk more about the ITP and your new role a little later in the recording here. So I've been super curious about last year, your first year of being a consultant, and so I'm curious about what are some of your takeaways from the recruiting process, what trends did you see, and what feedback were you getting from your clients about the process? Well, what I found was that it was a whole year. That's why I'm still kind of going into it this year, thinking, don't give up. Like it's November and I have some clients that are starting to reach out to me saying, I'm not getting any bites. I've applied to 50 different jobs and I'm like, don't give up because I got a client hired in June and she moved in July, you know, so you just never know the openings that are going to open up all of a sudden, maybe people are going to back out of their contracts and suddenly the school is going to be recruiting again. So it's always a case of keeping minds open, you know, regions, keeping the position. If you're set on just grade three, it might be a tough call. But if you're saying I'm an elementary teacher from let's say grade one to grade five, preferably lower elementary, but then you're keeping your options open. So I would say the biggest takeaway from last year was that there is no such thing as, oh, now it's too late. (laughs) It's never too late. When it comes to experiences from your clients, what were some things besides maybe getting frustrated that it was taking too long But also, if they get some choices, it's so great that they have you there to help get information, profile these schools, these cities, and these countries. I'll put in a little plug for our huge blog post on that title. How did you help people with that? What was going on? I had a number of clients with a couple of offers on the table. And so then, confidentially, I would go over their contract and take a look at, I myself wrote a blog article on the top 10 benefits that you can find in a contract. And so it's not just a salary and often those are tax-free salaries, but it's housing, it's professional development stipend, it's maybe some kind of a moving package, definitely flights, you know, well, I wouldn't say definitely because you're a doesn't do flights, but most of the time flights are included. So all of those benefits looking at the contracts and one of my favorite phone calls, I I remember uh, we did a video call for it was pros and cons of two offers and they couldn't be further different, you know, so it was really an analyzing. So it turned out after the phone call, I made a blog article about it before you sign a contract, read this article. And it was the pros and cons of the city and the pros and cons of the job, because we want to consider both aspects of our life. You know, when we're in the job, that's great. It's a school, we're a teacher or an administrator, and it's the four walls and we're all familiar with that. But then when you take in consideration your outside life, your personal life, now that's the city. So things like 
am I going to be safe? Is there pollution outside? Can I get my favorite coffee? Or all of these things that will make your life either very rich or very difficult, we need to consider. And so we took a look, my client and I, we took a look at both offers and kind of dissected the contract as far as financial ramifications. But then we looked at quality of life and what was the client looking for and what was the client going to get with either of these cities. And then she asked at the end, she said, so what would you do? And I said, nope, I don't tell you the answer, but I will say this. I'm so glad she did choose the way she chose because I get to follow her on Instagram and see all her great photos somewhere in Europe. So there we go. (laughs) I am so pleased to hear that you've done something like that. We made a blog post that was very similar. We went into super deep detail, but with a more broad idea of people being able to rate each school. And also there's a section where you can rate the city and then the country. And then my husband, Mark, created a scoring like with formulas so that you give a score from one to five for each element, and then it does a total for each school. But it's very subjective, isn't it? Because it would all depend on what someone's looking for. Absolutely. Well, it's not right. It's not entirely subjective. It's some of each. And you're right. And uh, so we did add in the opportunity for a fudge factor. You know, if there was an X factor, like I have friends at this school, Mm. for example, or the head of school comes highly recommended or whatever it is. And uh, so that's built into it, too. I just, I think it's pretty great to be able to somewhat objectify by putting in some numbers and uh, then people might be surprised to see, oh, hey, wait a minute, this school is rating higher than I thought at first blush. So just to open people's minds a little bit to more possibilities. But I think it's great that we were going down a very similar path there. Your blog post sounds very similar to ours. Well, and I think the biggest thing is, I think some of my best experiences have been places where I never, I mean, one of them I never even heard of. I had never heard of Muscat Oman before they reached out to me. But if we are only going to places we know or that we're familiar with, then we're really kind of cutting off our options for some fantastic adventures, some great professional development. I learned in Oman that I wanted to be an administrator, a school admin, and was encouraged down that path. I might never have thought of that if I had not gone there. So you were saying that we're kind of in the thick of recruiting season now. It's November. What are you seeing out there in the world of recruiting right now? Well, I am seeing a lot of jobs being posted, and that's exciting. I am also seeing schools hiring and taking the leap now, you know, a little bit earlier than maybe usual. I think we've all seen those job ads where they say closing date, December 3rd, or if the right candidate comes along. And I think schools are taking that leap and saying, you know, we have the right candidate. We've done the uh, due diligence, the reference checks and the interviews, and why not lock this person down before they get snatched up by another school? So I am seeing offers and I'm very excited, you know, when I see my clients writing me and telling me that, oh, you don't need to send me any more job leads. I've signed a contract with, you know, XYZ school and XYZ country. And I'm just, I'm always excited for them that they're finished, you know, because it is a very stressful part of living overseas is the job recruiting season. And I always say it's a little bit like a full-time job on top of your full-time job. You know, you get home, you start to think, okay, well, let me see what's out there. And oh gosh, okay, I need to get a cover letter for that application and tweak my resume for this application. And before you know it, maybe your weekends are taken up doing this. And so it is very stressful. And I know a lot of clients or a lot of people out there, uh, candidates, feel the pressure that I just want this over with. And they might just jump at that first offer. And Hopefully, with my help, I'm just saying, 
okay, let's kind of take this in and just see, see if this is the right fit before we just jump right at it. Yeah, wise words for sure. <laughs> well, let's continue with some of those words of wisdom. And I'm thinking back to your really helpful website. And so I'm just going to say, folks, go to JP Mint Consulting to get more information. There's so many blog posts. You've got a video or two up and just a lot of helpful information. So let's do some more words of wisdom. Like one I remember you sharing before was for people to keep a spreadsheet or some type of documentation of where they're applying, what information are they getting back from. So if you could offer a little bit more on that line of thinking. Yeah, no, I'm glad you mentioned it because in the end, I'm here to help people. And whether they want to hire me or whether they just want a lot of information for free, I'm happy. I'm happy that they come to my website and they get something out of it. I have tips. They used to be tips of the week, but I really don't have time to make a tip every week. Plus, after 50 tips, it's kind of like, okay, which, what am I going to use this week? <laughs> so I've, it's become about a once a month thing. But as you've mentioned, the spreadsheet I put out tips like of the websites that I'm finding or resources for looking for jobs like LinkedIn or Reddit, websites that we know, but maybe someone outside of the international education sphere wouldn't know like ISR, International Schools Review or International School Community. But one of the bigger tips that I often tell my clients is apply for everything. So my clients know the dartboard philosophy. I always say, throw everything at the dartboard until you hit that bullseye. And you never know when you're going to hit the bullseye until you've done a whole lot of interviews and you've done a whole lot of applications and you've realized that, yeah, you know what, this school that I applied for maybe say a month ago, and I've been interviewing with a number of schools, but this school just keeps coming back and it just feels right. And it's because you've taken all these other interviews. And, you know, when you come into an interview situation and it's not a good interview, that is knowledge. That is helping you make the decision the next time you have an interview. Like, wow, I really like how this school interviews me. It's like an organic conversation rather than a checkbox list of questions that I've got to answer and no follow up. That's the biggest thing, too, is you gauge the interest of the interviewer by the follow-up question. And if there is no follow-up question, there's not much interest. So I'm in total agreement with you. Apply to as many different schools as you can. And one of the things we hear from our guest is be flexible. Don't get yourself thinking it's got to be just this part of the world. And that's always really good advice. But the other day, Max was applying, well, looking to apply to a school in a certain country. And I said, Max, I want to check that out. So I went and did my research and I came back and I just said, Max, I just don't think that's going to be a good move or a good fit for you. So how do you handle on the good fit side, maybe the school and its lack of mission we know it's got to be accredited. If it isn't accredited, we know that's a red flag. How do you handle working with clients when you you know a school, a city, or a country just isn't going to be a, a good fit or just a good place for any of your clients? I've had a number of clients write back to me saying school XYZ has reached out to me for an interview. And I will tailor it. I'll say, okay, well, that's going to be an interesting interview. I really do recommend taking the interview. You never know what's going to happen during the interview process. For example, I've said that, and I've seen this happen where heads of schools interview, they say, you know, it's just not the right fit for us, but I have a friend who's at this school and I'm going to pass him on your CV or I'm going to pass her on your name because I think you would be a great fit for that school. So if you hadn't taken that interview, you would never have had that sort of network possibility. And so that's why I always recommend take every interview offer and then see where that interview can lead to. 
either possibly another interview, which then gives you that much more practice. But yes, I have had clients that have written me saying, I have an offer from this school and I will go and do research and I will come back and I will try and give them that full, you know, eyes wide open kind of mentality of, well, this is what you could be getting into if you do take this offer. But I never tell them don't take the offer or do take the offer. That's always up to them. I just give them a lot of information so that they can make the decision. Yeah, I know you're not a counselor and you're you're not a life coach, but you are doing some life coaching there. That's one of our mantras is that we don't tell people what to do. We give them information. We ask questions. We help them take different perspectives and then they can weigh the information and make some decisions. So that is so helpful, what you just said, the idea that that head of school, if you're going to interview with them, could network and have you connect to another school or move on to another school in a few years. And then you're applying and they go, oh, I remember you. The other end of the spectrum, uh, Max was looking at a school top tier, you know, probably one of the top five schools in the world. The chances are pretty slim. But I said, Max, go for it. If you get that interview, just like you're saying, Jacqueline, it's more experience. Boy, they are going to be on top of their game in their interview process. And then a few years later, I bet you that school keeps a record of you or those someone from that interview process goes to another school and they go, Maxwell Carpenter, let's find out where he is and what he's doing. Mm -hmm. Exactly. We think the world is huge, but we also know that the international education world is small and memories are long and, and people will remember years down the road. I interviewed with that school or I interviewed with that person and they'll recall you as well. So I feel like it's only time, you know, so you're, what you're doing is you're giving up of your free time or your weekend or maybe waking up a little bit extra early to make that interview. But that time is really well invested to know if the school would be a good school for you now or down the road and that networking possibility. And so I think it's always a good idea to take every offer of interview. So you've really alluded to this in a number of different ways, but let's give them the straight story. Why should someone consider becoming a JP Mint client? Sell us. Oh, okay. Well, I think when it just comes down to value for money, for one thing, the $99 that will get you a new CV, a new cover letter, and a video call with me to kind of set you on your path. Personally, I don't know of anyone else that's doing this for this amount of money. But even uh, most of my clients actually take the 149 package, which includes two video calls and also a contract review. So the contract review, that first time when they send me a confidential contract and I confidentially keep that contract, I don't tell anybody else about it, but I go through it and I give them back their uh, questions to go back to HR. And, you know, I didn't see any PD funding. Could you talk about that? Or I didn't see any kind of stipends for coaching. I'm a really big, I'm a big coach and I would really like to have an idea of what stipends you offer. So for that reason alone, uh, but also on top of the value of money, I look for you. I look for jobs for my clients and I'm constantly on Facebook and LinkedIn and I get a number of jobs sent to me. I sometimes get schools reaching out to me but I'm not working with any schools. And most of the schools have their own websites. And obviously that's what our, we can look for job listings. So sometimes I'll even just go to a school website out of the blue, a very good top school that I would love to see my clients go to. And I just pour down the list and look and see, oh, there's an opening for that client. And I send it to them. So they get job listings sent directly to their inbox and can start applying. And yeah, I don't rest until they're happy and they have a job. And so I'm in my second year of business and I have a couple of clients still from my first year 
because the jobs just weren't the right fit for them to jump to a new school. And so I've carried on with them. So I am happy to keep looking until they're happy. The other part of this, and we've spoken about it before, is that the recruiting process was a lot simpler when we started and when Audrey and I started even before you. And Captain Obvious here, we're talking about moving to another country, another job. Even if you're a veteran, things have changed so much from 20, 30 years ago that more than ever, we reach out to financial consultants, wellness coaches, all these experts in our regular lives. Why not do it for this huge life decision? So for our listeners, and we've got other consultant coaches on the website for folks to check out, but we always so appreciate Jacqueline coming on and sharing so many words of wisdom. But the big picture is it really helps. And thank you for all the help you're providing, Max. So thanks again. Yeah, I love having Max. As I said, he's my only physics teacher right now. So every physics opening I see, I throw at him and he gets to decide from that point on if he's going to apply, if it's a good fit. I hope that he does try, you know, the dartboard method where he just applies, applies, applies and sees what doors can open with that. Yes. And in his case, you provided some very valuable information that last year you saw a lot of physics openings. And I was sharing with him, I said, Max, that means that they signed two year contracts. So these are people just in their first year. So there's probably not going to be as much turnover. So what are the steps for someone to hire you? What do they do? Quite easily go to my website, jpmintconsulting.com. And I always recommend people look at my client testimonials because they're words from clients that I've helped and they can kind of flash through. I think there's 35 testimonials right now on my website. Because I don't ever delete them. I'm just happy to have, I kind of go through them. It's like my little photo album of where they're from and where they're going. And then sometimes I do update where they are because if they do change places since they were my first year client and now they might have changed places. But once they decide, okay, they read the testimonies and they think that, yeah, this could be good value for money. They hit the book now or the reserve now button. And I typically need two days. So I closed my schedule two days in advance. So if today is Monday, then the earliest they can book me is Wednesday. They send me their CV and cover letter immediately or as quickly as they can. So that that gives me the full two days to work on it. And then we meet in a video call where we go over those documents. I share with them those documents in Google Docs. We go over the edits and then I start looking for them. I give them a video call follow-up email with next steps so that it's all very laid out. What should they do next? Usually it's CV edits, cover letter edits, and then it might be, you know, taking a different photo for the CV, or it might be updating their LinkedIn or contacting their references to make sure that they have the right email and the right phone numbers. And then I start looking and I start sending them applications from around the world. And whether they end up going with a recruiter, I'm always of two minds. I had recruiters all my life while I was an international teacher. And I think I'm in addition to the recruiter. I don't replace the recruiter, but some people are quite happy with just keeping me and their own research skills but others want the full gamut. So they go with all the recruiters. I think that's great too. The more opportunities that they are out there, the better chances they'll have of finding the right fit, the great job. On that note, looking at last year, and I know we're still just relatively early this year, how's it going or how did it go for your veterans? that you're 80%, the ones that decided just to contact schools directly. One thing for our listeners, our newbies, is that you can set up a file with one of the big recruiting agencies so that these schools can go in and get all your information and 
you get the benefit that these agencies will list the packages and give you a lot more information. You don't have to go to a recruiting fair if you work with one of these outfits. But how did it go last year and this year with the veterans who just said, hey, I'm going to directly email schools that I'm interested in? Well, the funny thing is, I had a number of clients come back to me and say, you know, I was with X recruiter and Y recruiter, and they did not help me. And I just wish that I had saved the money. But then uh, definitely I had other clients that got their contacts or got their jobs thanks to being on the platform. So it really is a bit of a gamble. I always looked at it this way, taking a new job or trying to find a new position and getting that new job is going to be slightly expensive. But then in the long run, if you get the right school and the right package, it'll take care of itself. It'll pay for you know your whole recruitment, which is maybe the different platforms, a job fair, flying to that job fair, staying at the hotel or staying. I always stayed at a hotel down the road because I don't mind walking. And I always saved a little bit of money that way. So I never stayed at the, the actual, you know, Royal Orchid in Bangkok. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I look like really pricey. So I just stayed at the, you know, the Hotel Six or whatever down the road, but then I would just walk to the venues. But I always took that into consideration. That is part of the expense of finding a new job, but then you get a great job that's going to pay you a lot of money with a lot of great benefits. I just think of it as part of the expense. But that being said, that might be a reason why you don't want to do this every two years. I never recruited every two years. My first school that I went overseas, I stayed at eight years. And the second school, I stayed at seven years. So I really saved a lot of money on recruitment because I didn't go anywhere for 15 years. But that being said, you know, some clients have two and done, two and done, two and done. And then we just have to package that a little bit differently. And I have some creative ways of doing that where we can kind of mask that, you know, this wasn't a right fit. This wasn't a right fit. This wasn't a right fit. But I'm still looking for my, you know, not forever school, mind you, but my five, six year chunk school that I'm looking for. That connects to, I was on Reddit yesterday and someone wrote a very eloquent post, very long, that they had shifted. They were in Europe, they came to Asia, and they were starting at a new school and they were going through some struggles, just differences in culture, school management, things like that. And then all the very kind responders just say, this takes time. As we, Audrey and I talk about transitions all the time. So... It takes a while to get used to a new place and to get comfortable in your class, comfortable with the students, the culture and all that. So if you are like a hunter gatherer and you want to move every two years, just be ready. That can be pretty abrupt and you can be on edge a little bit because you don't quite get settled. So I would offer some advice for folks that are just starting out that it takes a few years to get settled in a place and really get comfortable with your teaching and your living? Well, I remember uh, arriving at my second school and not being so crazy about the program, the French program that they had. And I went into my, you know, I took an appointment with my principal and I said, any chance that I can just kind of blow this up with TNT and, and start fresh? And he said, that was why we hired you. And I was like, excellent. (laughs) And so I worked with the Spanish teacher who was a nationally board certified teacher. And the two of us created a French and Spanish program that was bar none, just fantastic for us and fantastic for the kids. And that's why I stayed for seven years because I got to see that creation and I got to see three, four, five cohorts go through that program and become bilingual or trilingual or multilingual. And The reason moving on was, you know, the challenge maybe wasn't there anymore because I had already created kind of my program. Now, what do I do? Am I going to go to the next school and do this? And that's when I stepped into admin because I wanted a different challenge. Jacqueline, I have a question that I'm hoping you're willing to tackle, which is, 
some clients may have had the idea that, hey, why don't I just, instead of hiring a consultant, why don't I just have chat GPT write my resume and cover letter? I'll throw in some information and, you know, have it come up with something that would work. And what would you say to those people? I would love to see that CV. I haven't drunk the chat GPT Kool-Aid yet. <laughs> I've always been a very late adopter to tech and things that are coming out just to kind of see how things will land. I was very late to Instagram. I never got on Snapchat, so I don't know if that's still out there. But for me, the benefit of having a human being help write your CV and that human being has been on both sides of the table as far as candidate and as well as an admin, head of department, dean of students, vice principal, and principal. I think having a human being write your CV really gives you an advantage because they are your audience. So I write for the audience of the human resources department that might not be native English speakers. So we have to watch the caliber of the English language that we use in our CVs, but also the head of school or the principal or the head of department that might be seeing the CV. And I think there's something to be said about an AI might not have those kind of filters to be able to distinguish what they need to highlight in a candidate's profile. When I get a client's CV, my wheels are already spinning about how I can see, oh, this is a strength. We need to play this up. Oh my gosh, this is like so unique. We need to put this at the top. And so I'm already putting that puzzle piece of their CV together, just looking at their CV. I don't know that an AI can do that, but I'm happy if it can, because maybe it'll make my job easier down the road <laughs> and I can do consulting 100% of the time and not actually, you know, tab, tab, or, <laughs> or, oh, wait, this font is the wrong size, or, you know, maybe AI will help me down the road. But right now I still feel like there's something to be said about the human element. Well, education is full of human beings, so that's a really good point. And let me add, I was just reading this morning, I get a lot of newsletters, and boy, howdy, I can tell when it's generative AI created. And the two words that come into my brain are mechanical and robotic. And potentially it's going to get better, and it can help with grammar and syntax and things like that, that's for sure. But you just nailed it there, Jacqueline, that human touch, that filter of building off of the client and expanding on what really connects to the school, each individual school, is you help personalize their approach to each of their applications. So that's a real value add. Now, I look forward to the day where I don't have to write the blog article or the tip of the week. And I just, in fact, my website is a Wix.com website. And I noticed this new button. I haven't clicked on it because I'm scared, but it says generative AI. And I think what it means to say is like, if I click on that button, it might write my blog article for me, but I don't know. There's something very invasive about that. I, I want my words to be my words, not some robot that thought up these words for me. So, but maybe, who knows, maybe that'll come down the road. I wonder what this red button does. <laughs> <laughs> Well, certainly there's very clear value in people hiring you, working with you, getting jobs through you, hopefully. And so I think you've really started a wonderful resource here. Let's think about the other hat that you've been wearing recently, that of podcaster. And you mentioned the ITP earlier, the International Teacher Podcast. Please tell us a little bit what it's like to be the ones asking the questions along with the guys at the ITP. Well, I have thoroughly been enjoying. I say that the best part of my day is the video calls with my clients. The second best part of my day is if I get to record a podcast with Greg and Kent. I have yet to meet Matt, but I hope he does join us at some point. Greg and Kent and myself, we just have a hoot. We just laugh a lot. 
We are still very goofy. And I'm happy to say, I don't think I've changed that too much (laughs) for our listeners where we do. I end up just laughing as much as they do. The interviews are oftentimes my friends and former colleagues or former supervisors. I had my high school principal mentor who helped me on my path to administration. He was one of our guests. And so I've been loving reconnecting to the guests that we have on ITP because they're friends of mine. But then also we've been having a couple of authors come on and it's always interesting to hear their take on international education and their path. What I've noticed is that my interview skills for mock interviews with my clients have improved since I've become a podcaster because the conversation and the flow of the ITP interview is the ideal mock interview situation where the interviewer is listening, actively listening, and then asking follow-up questions, you know, or Kent is really great for, let's just take a step back. You know, he's often saying, let's just take a step back here. And can you talk to us about this point that you mentioned, but that's following up, that's showing interest. And so I've found that the biggest challenge for me is to not interrupt. (laughs) It's like, so hard because I want to jump in and it's not, I want to jump in and tell my story. I want to jump in and find out more information, but then I realize they might actually say it. So just stop, listen and let them talk because I'm just bubbling with questions. I want to know more and more and more details, but I think that's the biggest challenge is to just let them tell their story. I'm with you there. That's why I mute my mic and bite my tongue and wait to hear what they say. And I do. I love just diving in and asking more and more questions. And I will echo what you said that I think Kent is really good at that, listening carefully and then going back. So shout out to Kent. And shout those out to guys, Kent the cat guy. Yeah, those guys do make me laugh. So I'm so glad you have connected with them in that way. It's awesome. And I want to do a shout out to Greg. I wish there was some way in the podcast app that you could give feedback right away. He recently did an interview with a psychologist. Anna. Right. Who had shifted into wellness coaching, Mm -hmm. which is such a big topic in our world today. And he did such a great job of active listening Mm -hmm. because he was walking her through her story. And it was funny. I was just kind of smiling here. He was being the life coach to the life coach. Mm -hmm. He was so insightful and asked such great questions. It was just a wonderful interview. So if folks haven't listened to that one, definitely take a look, see, and a a good listen. Well, fortunately now, because I'm such a Facebook fan, there is now a place for ITP fans to go to And they can give their comments back on episodes or they can just post and say, this is what I look like when I'm listening. Uh, We had a a mushroom gatherer from Europe who took a photo of her mushrooms and said, I was listening to a podcast in the forest today and picking up mushrooms. I love this kind of thing. So it's ITP expats and it's a Facebook group. So they can come on and they get first dibs on the podcast when it drops. Greg lets me know, and then I let the Facebook listeners know that a new podcast is out. But sometimes they get the backstory or they get behind the scenes footage in the sense of, I try and take a screenshot every time we do a podcast. So then people can get on there and talk about their favorite episodes or what they liked about a particular episode. So David, we invite you, if you haven't joined yet, to get on there and then you can say, hey, Anna, you know, this was a great interview. I really enjoyed it. I think that's an awesome idea. We've thrown that occasionally into our Facebook group as well. We don't get a whole lot of comments. I'm not sure what's going on with that, but maybe those guys can give us some tips on getting more interaction going. So I am in your Facebook group. I think I've put a couple comments, but I do want to honor the great episode there that Greg did. So I'll jump in. Well, speaking of Facebook, what are the various ways that people can follow you? I am on everything. (laughs) So first they can go jump onto my website, 
and have a look at the different tips and blogs that I've written there. They can reach out to me on Instagram, JP Mint Consulting. They can tweet me at JP Mint Consult. I'm also on YouTube with JP Mint Consulting. And my LinkedIn is my name. So Jacqueline Malay, M-A-L-L-A-I-S. So please feel free to contact and connect with me on LinkedIn. I always accept everybody's connections. And then they can also email me at jpmintconsulting at gmail.com. So I have had a couple of clients actually just Google JP Mint Consulting and something pops up. So that's the nice thing about the Google SEO is that Essentially, it's me whenever they type anything like that. It's awesome. You're everywhere and easy to find, and that's what people want. I'm just going to take a moment to go back, a la Kent, and ask you to give us a teeny bit more about your YouTube channel. Tell us what you're doing with that. Oh, not very much, to be quite honest. I've presented now twice at my alma mater where I did my master's of educational leadership at the College of New Jersey. And so they just had their second global ed fest. It's a virtual conference where they have any number of guests present on any number of topics. And so I was able to present this year and last year. So those presentations are on my YouTube channel as well as my two free webinars when I first started out in April 2022 and May 2022. I wanted to get word out that I was available, that these are some of the tips that I offer. And so I video recorded those presentations as well. Now, just under six months ago, I was celebrating my first year anniversary with Greg and Kent on ITP because they were celebrating their second on the exact same day, if you can believe. Cool. They started their podcast April 2nd and I started my website April 2nd. And so when we got together, I voluntarily challenged myself to get on TikTok. And I thought if I can start doing reels, Instagram reels, TikTok, whatever they're called, videos, and then YouTube shorts, and Facebook stories. So yeah, basically one video on four different platforms, but I just haven't had the chance yet. I think that's going to maybe be a spring slash summer project because there's definitely no way I can start that project at this point with business booming. And I'm happy that it's booming in the sense that people are reaching out, they're looking for help, And I'm here for that. That's what I'm here for. I'm going to help them find their next job. And hopefully that will be their dream school. Nice. Helping people have their dreams come true. What an awesome calling. It has been very fulfilling. It's been very humbling. As I mentioned, like, who am I? What kind of expertise do I have? And then you start to realize the experience you have, the stories, the, you know, the good and the bad. We learn like our students from the mistakes we made. And we also learn from the bad experiences we've had. And those have helped me counsel some teachers into maybe you don't really want to go down that route if that's not who you are and try and help them from following those paths that we maybe followed. And I'm kind of getting into it dark section, but yeah, where it can be very ego shattering. And I want them to have successful experiences overseas. Well, I love that MO. Well, I would say that I still very firmly believe that this is the best kept secret in education going overseas and teaching, especially for any teacher's as we say, back home, that might be feeling the grind, that might be feeling like they're losing their passion in teaching, you know, with standardized testing and all the other things that take our time other than strictly teaching students and enjoying those aha moments, those kind of go away. I mean, it's not that they completely go away overseas, but the adventure of living in a new country, in addition to teaching our forte or our field of expertise, just makes every day an adventure. And that's why I keep saying this is the best kept secret. 
it was something that I found having taught three years in Canada in a small rural school where students just didn't want to learn what I was teaching. I was teaching French at the time, and we were 20 minutes outside of the national capital where you needed to be bilingual, and they didn't see the need to learn French. I went overseas after the three years. I went overseas, landed in Istanbul, and found parents saying to me, how can I get my child to learn more French? And I just went, pinch me, where am I living right now? The parents were on my side. They wanted their children to learn. And this is what we're finding. When we go overseas, we have parents on the same team as teachers looking for the best for our students and their children. We're all on the same team. And so that's why I'm always so happy when I have especially new clients who are joining the international world and are a little nervous about navigating it and they want maybe a guide. And I'm happy to be that guide. I'm happy to help them navigate the application process, uh, the interviews. I get to do mock interviews with them if they want with some of the questions I've used as a principal overseas. And then that all important offer and going through the offer and seeing if there are any questions we want to ask back to the HR. And so, yeah, I think that right now we're in the bulk of the recruiting. I never want to say we're at the beginning, we're at the middle or at the end, because it really is an all year process. I just know that coming up in about a month, schools will start going on holidays. And very often internationally, that means you need to give your intent if you're staying or if you're leaving to the school you're at. If you're international and you have a two-year contract and you're in that second year, typically in the next month, schools are going to be asking you, are you staying? Are you going? Because they need to start recruiting. Now, that doesn't mean that jobs haven't already been starting to list. Some jobs have been, especially admin jobs are listed earlier on in the school year, like August, September, October, but all year long, we're recruiting all year long. Schools are looking to hire for the following year. Well, thank you so much, Jacqueline, for once again, taking the time out of your now busier than ever schedule to chat with us and As always, you bring a lot of value to the table and people would be very well advised to look you up and check your website out and read those testimonials and give you a shout. So thanks again. Thank you so much. And I forgot to say that I got a couple of clients from Educators Going Global (gasps) podcasts as well. Yes. So you guys are part of my sources. There's a source column that I have in my spreadsheet for my clients. And the sources, ITP Podcast or Google or Reddit or my website or friend, you know, so friend of so-and-so, like word of Mm -hmm, mouth. mm -hmm. But there is an EGG in there, a couple of EGGs in there. Excellent. (laughs) (laughs) Gracias, Jacqueline. De nada, mi, mi placer, completamente. Muchas gracias para su tiempo esta noche. Gracias. Thank you for joining us today on Educators Going Global. You can find this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and all the other usual suspects. Please subscribe, like us, and leave a review on Apple and Spotify, and let your teaching friends know about us so we can grow our community. Please reach out at educatorsgoingglobal at gmail.com and join our Facebook group, Educators Going Global, If you have ideas, comments, or wish to share a Going Global story of your own. You can also find us on Instagram at Educators Going Global. Please visit our website as well, www.educatorsgoingglobal.com. All our podcast episodes are on there by topic, along with blog posts, Going Global stories, and our ever-growing resource library. For now, this is Audrey. And David. Inviting you to travel, teach, and connect with us.